Hello. Uh, welcome to another Lived Quality Conversation on the Lived Quality Podcast. Uh, today, I'm joined once again by Faith. Uh, we've had Faith, you know, several episodes before. Uh, and, you know, I, I don't, she doesn't need another introduction. I don't think no. like we need another introduction. Not at all. If, it, if, if, you, if you watch this podcast, you know who Faith is. Exactly. Well, but Faith, if they're new... <laughs> yeah well if they're yeah. new um faith is a doctor she she's dr faith lees um mm-hmm. but she's also coach so i also call coach faith lees and oh my goodness. she's <laughs> she's a podcaster she's a youtuber she's a mom uh mm-hmm. she's a person who wears many hats and you know has very many gifts that she gives to this world um and she does a lot of work on personal development. Uh, she has her own personal career journey that she shares on one of our YouTube channels. Um, and Faith is just a very knowledgeable person, very wise person that I enjoy having long conversations with. Uh, we've talked about, um, you know, self-awareness before, and we've done a bit of a deep dive on that. Uh, and a few other interesting subjects in the past. Uh, so today, uh, I'm very privileged to have Faith on again. And um, I'll, before I let Faith introduce herself and, you know, we jump into it, uh, I just wanted to say that I'm having this opportunity to speak to Faith again and again. Uh, and other people like Faith around my community is such a privilege that I'm really enjoying and it's helping this podcast really grow and reaching out to um, a lot of this community and inspiring many people out there. So thank you, Faith, for joining us today. You're most welcome, Clayton. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to talk I, to talk with you yet again, because really we can get so busy, but I'm here to talk to you and I'm excited to see where our conversation is going to lead us today. Yes. And as usual, as it's tradition here on the Lift Quality Conversations, um, we start off somewhere and the conversation just flows. So, <laughs> mm. so like, was, so Faith, uh, you know, if I was to ask you, you know, you've been putting out a lot of work recently. Um, you've started um, another channel where you're sort of like, sharing your spiritual journey you've started another channel where you no, actually that's the new one but you've had you've had you know a coaching one you've had uh uh you know fitness one and so you've mm. been putting a lot of you know these things out there that are really mm. inspirational and mm. and sort of like shaping young minds and inspiring other people the the you said the area that I'm interested in trying to uh, explore with you today is what is that, what is inspiring you to, you know, share? Because like, like, you know, I was sharing, first, like, I, I, and I was speaking to someone recently, and then uh, last night we were watching a movie, the Lego movie, right? I haven't <laughs> I don't seen, know it. If you've seen it. Yeah, <laughs> there's <Not yet. laughs> It's, it's an old movie, uh, but it's just Lego characters. But when you pay mm. attention to the storyline, you know, these children movies, if you watch them as an adult and you, you start to think things through the, the philosophy and the psychology behind, it's quite interesting. So mm. it's based on this character who is like just a very regular character in the realm of Lego. <laughs> and he's, he's just a construction worker who knows who is not special. He, they call him like he's not a special person, but they're saying he's going to be the special person. <laughs> right? And mm. they, they prophesy that he's going to get this vision. Well, mm. someone had a vision that this person would become special and they would find mm. the thing that would save their society. And, and then That's the amazing. event happens. <laughs> I know, mm. right? Like it happens. Mm. Mm. And everybody, he wakes up and everybody's telling him, so you're the special person. You need to save the world. And so you're like, what do you mean I'm the special person? It's like, yeah, yeah, you're the special. Everybody said, the legend said, you're the special person. We have been waiting for you. Here you are, now save us. And he's like, uh, okay, 
what oh. am I supposed to be doing? <laughs> and, and so he has to land on the job, right? <laughs> yeah. To become mm-hmm. special. And eventually he does become special. Uh, but he, like, the, there was this weird thing about him in that his mind was so empty that he did not have any preconceptions of what he needed to be that mm-hmm. the moment the vision was given to him of what he should be, all of a sudden, he, you know, he just had to kind of like work hard to become that thing. And then he became that thing eventually. Okay. And then he became special <laughs> in, in a way. Uh, but it was, a, it was a very interesting journey, which reminded me of, 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 of you know, that concept of uh, creativity because like when for most creative people they they get a vision of a certain you know I was telling this before like you, you you get a vision of a certain reality that is not yet real but you have seen it somewhere it's like it's not yet there but you have seen it and so i think you get sort of like i suspect right like you get a calling <laughs> to to make that vision a reality and so then you go to work start building it and i i'm getting a sense of what you're doing is along those lines like there's something you've seen and all these pieces of work you're doing are sort of like in service to building that reality is like so i don't know am i getting it is is my suspicion on point or is it way something different <laughs> i also I don't, don't know, know. at this point at this point i also do not know but this as you say there's that conviction you get over time and truth be told um a person who loves to take my time when it comes to things sometimes i make impulsive decisions which turn out to be okay. Sometimes I take my time to think about something. So when you talk about all the things I'm doing, I have to admit that I have understood the season I'm in right now. It's a season of creation. A season of creation in the sense that I feel the impulse and the compelling to create, to get out of my shelf and share things that I've always wanted to do. But I, at some point I had excuses. I had reasons as to why I wasn't qualified to do that work. I had all this imposter syndrome, fears that were stopping me from doing that. And to, truth be told, this has come a long way. This year, every year I choose a word of the year. I share this in one of my YouTube videos. And I say that by choosing a word of the year, it's like my guiding light. It guides me what direction I need to take. And before I choose this word, I don't just come up with it randomly, like I'm just walking and this word comes into my mind. I'm like, oh yeah, this is my word. I pray about it. I believe in Jesus. Like he's like my guide. He's like my creative director. He helps me come up with different things. So when I pray, I usually take my prayers in such a sense, ask God, what word should I choose for there? Last year, my word was faith. No, no, no. Last year, my word was nourishment. This year, my word is faith. No, 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 sorry. Last year, my word was nourishment. This year, my word is fearless. And that I draw it from Isaiah 41 verse 10 that says, do not be, do not fear anything. I'm with you. Do not be dismayed. Um, that's, that's, a, that's a way it says. And I didn't know that fearless would was going to really lead me to the path that I'm on right now. Because there are so many things previously I've always feared to do because I'm thinking, okay, I'm not the most qualified person to talk about this topic or I'm not the person who feels I know it all or how will my people notice, how will people say. So it had to always be about that fear. And when I chose that word, I didn't know that this is the direction it would lead me. We've only been four months into the year. Today is April. We are in April right now as we record this. But I've seen that that word is really guiding me, even unintentionally. Some of the things I do, I don't just first go back and say, okay, my word is fearless, let me do this. I've just found that all the pieces of the puzzle are falling together. It's like a domino effect. By choosing the word of the year, I've had to overcome these fears of how people perceive me, the fear of being seen, the fear of putting myself there. I've had to overcome fears of 
sharing more about God because I have a value system that I operate on. My value system entails everything that I consider valuable in my life. And it's those things that have led me to who I am right now. But if I exclude my faith, that means I'm not being truthful to the person I am. So I had to come to terms that I'm like, you know what, faith? I wouldn't say I've studied theology. I've not studied the Bible, like to know it in and out. But I have something to contribute. And it's this conviction that has led me to create my newest podcast. It's called For His Glory. It's still on your YouTube, but it will get to other places in due time. YouTube and Spotify so far, but that I'm just sharing specific information about glorifying God in the way I'm living, things I've learned on my faith journey, the questions that have helped me get to where I am, the revelations that might not have been like a profound revelation, but they've been a revelation in a sense that there are some things I've learned and I'm like, oh yeah, when I do this, this happens. When I pray like this, this happens. Or when I take this to God, I feel less anxious. So it's been that the word of the year has led me to who I am. And also the fact that I want to create a hub around myself of the things I consider valuable. I believe somewhere there's a person who might be female or male who likes the things I like. That person might be looking for more information about their religion, their faith. That person might be looking for how to become fit, how to establish a career they love. So I'm trying to piece all my pieces of what makes me as a person into something that is coherent in the sense Mm. that I don't want to just have one channel whereby today I talk about this, today I talk about that, today I talk about that. I want it to be like separate entities that I can merge together to talk about the person that I am. So hence Mm. the things I'm doing. And it's really helped me come out of my shell because now when I'm sharing what I'm sharing, I'm not sharing from a perspective that I know it all, but I'm sharing the perspective that this is what I know and this is what has Mm. worked and this is what... I think someone else who might be looking for the same information will find. It's been great. Also understanding that in life, we all go through seasons. As we see the world, how it operates, we have four seasons. We have winter, autumn, summer, spring. There are times of your life that you need to understand where you are. Some of us force things. When you decide to force how your life should go, you live with a lot of anxiety you live with a lot of ungratefulness, you live with a lot of just questions that are not really helping you move ahead to the person that you want to be. But if we embraced our seasons based on what you're going through, primarily right now in my season is more of creating and nurturing. I'm nurturing my family, my kids. Of course, I've had two. One of them is almost two years. My son is almost five years. But when you see you're nurturing those kids to become who they are, Sometimes it might it might be a seed of exploring whereby you're trying out different things to see what exactly works. Sometimes it might be a season of building in the sense that you're trying to put one brick on, on another. Then sometimes it might be a seed for you to wait, just sit and wait and wait to see your fruits coming out. Then sometimes it might be a seed for you to harvest. So, and a lot of the times we fail to understand the season. So we live with that fear of, I've done this now, it's not working, should I quit? But Mm. when you notice, even when you plant a seed in the ground, it has to first die before it comes out. That's the science. When you plant a bean today, it will die in the sense that it will open up. Then after three or four weeks, then it will sprout out to be a bean seedling. And what seedling ended up creating the bean in the end of the day? So if you don't appreciate the season you're in, you end up living in that unfulfillment because... You're looking at things that should be happening at a very fast state. So I'm in the season of creating and I'm enjoying the season of creating. And it's leading me to different things. At 2 a.m. I can wake up with this idea and I'm like, I just need to write it down. Because if I don't write it down, it's going to get out of my head and I won't be able to remember it. Hmm. So those are like the two things that I've really noticed. The season also, my word of the year has led me to what I am and also being intentional because if you have a word of the air you have to really be intentional towards that word it might not encompass everything of your life but at least it gives you that guidance that this is what i'm concentrating on because as i've said i used to have so many fears of what will happen how will it happen 
But now yeah. the fear has been stripped because I'm like, my word is fearless. If I'm fearless, what does a fearless person do? Hmm. They don't call in and feel like, oh, yeah, I cannot talk because of this. They are strong. They are brave. They share with boldness. So that's where I am right now. And hopefully that answers your question. We can really go deep and explore this further. Yeah, no, that's that's really great. And um, thank you for sharing that. Um, uh, and a lot of in there that you've shared really deeply resonates with me because like you setting that, you know, coming up with a method of setting an, an intention and, you know, it's like, uh, and making it um, very focused such that you can find that one point. Uh, it reminds me of um, something that I've been, you know, sort of like trying to understand as well. It's like, uh, I think it's a concept that's used a lot in design. Uh, yeah, basically in, in general in design, they, 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 there's divergence and convergence, right? So when you, when you're trying to expand, um, your thinking, uh, mm -hmm. you, you use divergent thinking. So you, you'll explore ideas. So you just open up to, uh, whatever ideas are out there, but then, uh, mm -hmm. Once you put out ideas, so like you do, you use this like in a workshop exercise, right? Like if you want to innovate an idea, it's like you're thinking, how do I solve this specific problem? Everybody give me an idea and there's no wrong ideas. Let's just write all of them down. So you write like, you know, I don't know, however many, 50, 100 ideas. But then uh, you have now to converge them. You have to pick the one out of the many and go like, okay, this specific one seems like, it, it, it can address about like it, it compounds about like 50 of these that if we achieve this one, we can achieve 50 of these ideas that we've come together mm. and, and put out. And so you converge on the one. And then mm. once you're on that one, then you expand it again. Right. Okay. <laughs> and try and see uh, what are the facets in there. Then, then you focus on each one of those facets. So it's like a, a, a divergence and convergence mechanism. Um, so I was thinking about that process from design, and I also noticed that a, if you juxtapose that with personalities, um, naturally we have our biases uh, of the things that, let's say, we are more experienced in and the things that we are not experienced in, right? So for the things that we... Um, experienced in we tend to think a bit more divergently about them it's like mm. you're an expert uh, so you're a, a virologist right like the yeah. moment you walk into a laboratory right mm. uh you take that space seriously you you don't play around in the laboratory you know how to walk you know what each of those signals means uh what things to be careful about what things not to be careful about you know which places you have freedom to play and which places, oh, don't touch that. That's here. You need to wear gloves here. You have to maintain a high level of uh, hygiene. And if you want to have your lunch, you can go outside, right? You don't eat inside the place near the mic microscopes where you're, you're investigating stuff, right? So you, and, and all this I'm speculating, but you would know more about this. Like when the lab is not just a lab for you, right? For me, it's kind of like, yeah, it's, I, I think about like a science lab, you know, the one we saw in high school, but for you, it's like, no, no, it's not just that. It's That's like mm -hmm. a sacred place when you walk into it because like it opens up for you and all, everything has meaning. But then if I took you to, let's say, something you don't know much about, right? Something you don't normally do. And let's say, for example, I take you to... Uh, a train repair station, right? Yeah. You won't, yeah. you won't <laughs> know. Hmm. It won't open up itself to you like a lab because for you this is it's a very closed concept. It's it's like a, it's just a train. So you look at it it's like yeah, train. I use it. I get on. I hop off. Uh, I tap my card here, and that's 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 that's, that's how trains work, right? <laughs> and the, the 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 whatever the train repair specialist will go is like. No, this is, the, then they'll have the divergent view of it, yeah. like how the one you have on a lab, right? <laughs> so mm -hmm. you find like when, when you're looking at concepts that you don't have a deep understanding of, 
you tend mm. to think of them in a close way and those concepts that you have a deep understanding of these they are so broad they almost paralyze you with too much information because there's a lot there yes. and so we tend to we tend to have those ways of seeing and so when we when we are and those things are always happening to us in every situation right mm. and so the, the our, our inspirations are usually drawn like if we find the the thing that is of interest then we're going to try and expand it more and so for me what it seems from what you're describing is like when you when you pray and then uh you know you do your that praying and meditation and the word becomes clear to you what that word is going to be so you hone in on it <laughs> you converge in on that word yeah then now you take that word and then now you apply it in an a divergent way it's like okay how do i apply this fearlessness in how am i living yeah. to to this how am i doing it every day how am i practicing that and it sort of like uh inspires you and guides you and gives you the boundaries within which you're working and that it's like such a great model right it's it's, it's very <laughs> practical very functional and i and i and i really really appreciate it and appreciate you sharing that and the other thing that came up was um you you sound like you're exploring your personhood um and and you spoke about jesus as well and it reminded me about um uh you know when jesus started his work right it's like what uh in john vavake's work he talks about this in one of in his um uh awakening to meaning crisis uh series in there he speaks about jesus and he says he characterizes it this way he goes like when jesus started his movement uh at the time one of the thing he was really trying to achieve philosophically was mm-hmm. to share his personhood because he he believed he had done the work that sort of like put him in a place that he lived in alignment with you know the source of being generally which in our christian context that would be god right and so it's like he had cultivated that relationship and it was embodied in him and so he was the he was uh the personification of living in an aligned way right and and so his gift was to be able to 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 embody virtues that allow you to live in alignment with the source of being right and so he's the person and so his objective was to take that person who done spread it kind of like and the, we use this metaphor a lot in christianity like spread the fire like mm. the fire of the candle right you you take one candle and light other candles right yeah. and so in a similar way he did the same thing like he goes uh, he went out to the people who were not living in alignment with the source of being and he lived he went to live with them and his hope was it will rub off right and it did rub off because <laughs> yes wherever he showed up and he did things his way go like hmm he does things a bit strange but it's very interesting <laughs> it uh, it sort of like transforms the whole way of doing things maybe maybe we should just do what he's doing and in the process of embodying that example and uh, doing it with other people he started to share his personhood with these people like lighting those candles and there you go you get the birth of christianity and here we are several thousand years later still practicing and still taking that personhood and you know embodying it and passing it on and so it's uh it, 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 it seems to me that in a similar fashion you're also taking whatever that you've you've embodied and now you are trying to pass it on in whichever form you can and i think right now you're using these platforms and these channels um yeah because from what you shared it seems that's sort of like one of your objectives as well and i think it's a great thing it's very inspiring because like i think 
I'm also trying to do the same thing with this podcast with yes. the people I'm talking to. And uh, yeah. Um, and then the other thing was sort of like you touched on coming out of your shell, right? Like the, the hesitation before. <laughs> and that reminded me, you know, when uh, when people say, oh, no, I had to come out of the closet. And it's like for a long time <laughs> I, I lived... <laughs> You know, I didn't. I had this secret life, right? Mm. <laughs> and then, at some point, I couldn't live it secretly anymore. <laughs> then I had mm. to kind of like bring it out. Uh, and so it seems also as well like you you've had enough time to think all those different aspects through, and now you've got into a place whereby uh, you're more confident and you're more certain, you're more clear on no, this is this is the ground where I stand, and therefore. I need to expand that ground out, um, but I, it's fine. Like I need to own my ground and, and be in the, in this, on this ground, on this space. And then that's how I can expand it. I don't know how all that fits with you. <laughs> yeah. That's cause for fearlessness because when you think about it, this, as you've explained, I love your philosophy, like you're so philosophical. It's amazing to really listen to and also watch how your wisdom unfolds. And what I've learned from what you've just said is, of course, there's this ground I've always been on, but there was that hesitation and that fear. Most of it was external because we fear things. Our brain tricks us to think of things that we should be scared of. Our brain still operates like a primitive brain. We think about fear in the sense of people. Initially, we used to fear animals, lions, and lacking food and water. Our necessities were more of our fears, but now that we've evolved and reached that extent whereby our fears are now more relatable in the sense of the world that we live in. So my fear had always been, how will people perceive me? I've always wanted to talk about these topics, honestly, but Mm. there was never that confidence in why I wanted to share them and in what I could bring to the table. Mm. But because I've had over four years to do this deep work on myself every day, as we've discussed in the previous episode, every day that these constant questions I ask myself, I'm like, am I living to my potential? If anything happened and I'm not here tomorrow, would I be satisfied with the life that I've created? Would I be satisfied with the legacy that I have? And Mm. it's that compelling that has gotten me to this level of thinking, you know what, Faith? You only have one life to live on this earth. You either use it to how you want it to be or you let everyone else's life affect you and everyone's fears or everyone's perceptions affect you. That means I'm not living to my true identity. I'm not living to my true self if I let all the things that I've always been scared about stop me and I won't be able to cause the impact that I've always dreamt about. As you say, there's this ideal reality i have created in my brain and i understand how it works it might not be in depth but there's this reality that i have of a life that i want to create of an environment of how my work i want it to be perceived and that's the reason why i'm doing what i'm doing wow and it's great like um thank you for doing that work and so um so what other thing that then I'm curious about, it's like, um, in doing this work, uh, so maybe if there are people out there who are at a place where you were before you came to do, uh, this work and I don't know, like, what is it that really you'd say, where were you before you did the work, right? It's like, why is it that the work is, is so obvious now in terms of like, no, I, th- I think I should do this now, right? Like, like why not before? What was it that that sort of like held you back in a way? Like, I mean, you've touched a, bit, a little bit about it. Like, you know, you had the hesitation and you had uh, like some doubt. Um, so I guess what, what I'm curious, like, what was the turning point? Like, what is it that changed th- that sort of like then you went, you go like, you know, no, I can't. I'm, 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 I'm definitely jumping off of this, whatever, the, where I am, and going to do other things. And mm-hmm. 
because like you know you you, you touched on it you, you even put a time frame you say like four years ago right like you've been like seems like these four years ago there was something else <laughs> and then four years later there is this right <laughs> so yeah. curious, what, what happened yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so let's go back to 2019 2019 um the beginning of the year my plan yeah. was to finish my phd and also a plan of starting a family you know because it had been long it had been long since i came to terms that i need to really pull up my shoes and start a family and just have some little ones but i had all these fears about motherhood about parenting in australia being away from family there was all those fears but the most important thing was to make sure i make sure that when i'm planning to have a family i finish my phd because it took a toll on me so I knew I was going to finish when it got to like February. I'm like, ah, now we can think of a family. Of course, as you know, I conceived and I had this baby I was expecting. And on that expecting journey, it was not a smooth journey. My envision of parenthood was totally different from what I experienced. I knew you get pregnant, you're fine, you're okay, your bump grows, you keep on seeing the bump, posting it or sharing your news. I'm a first time mom, I'm going to be a mom. But it took a toll around seven months, no, seven weeks, seven weeks pregnant. I ended up having a medical emergency that ended up me having an emergent surgery. So mm. as they wheel me into the surgery room, I'm pregnant and I really, really want my child to survive. And it was connected to my reproductive system. So while I'm getting in there, of course, I tell, I was with my husband and I also tell a few friends and also my family back home. So all of them were on their toes wondering what's happening. Is she going to stay pregnant? Is she going to lose the pregnancy? As God would have it, I prayed to God, let everything go well and let me continue being pregnant. Long story short, the surgery was very effect, was very successful. I ended up coming out well. I was The first thing that... As soon as the, the anesthesia wore off, I asked them, am I still pregnant? They're like, yeah, yeah, everything well, well. I didn't even ask about what they were doing. All I wanted was to know that my child was still in my womb growing. Mm -hmm. And that was mm -hmm. it. And that was one of the prayers I told God. I'm like, God, I don't want to lose this pregnancy. I don't know what will come out when I get into that surgery room. I don't want to worry about that. But I'm putting my life before you and the life of my child. That was the first thing. As the pregnancy went on, of course, I was considered high risk because I just had an operation that was invasive on my reproductive system. So I was given more of a bed rest and I didn't get to do all the things I'd planned or I'd envisioned to do while I was expecting a child, you know, mm -hmm. because I knew I was a fit person. I was going to continue doing my pregnancy workout. I was going to be motivating other people who are pregnant. I'll be sharing my journey, what I'm eating, what I'm doing, how I'm, how I'm coping with this new life that I'm creating. That was off the table. What happened? I had to be on bed rest from March. I think it from May until I gave birth to December. I could do barely minimal work. I had to cancel my gym membership. I had to change my lifestyle to be more of sedentary than a person who used to be active and walking around. I was also put on progesterone just to make sure my hormones were okay. So as a result, I gained a lot of weight because this was not a life I was used to. And I was so at some point, I think I went with undiagnosed depression and pregnancy anxiety. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what it was, but every day I would be anxious. Every day I would go to move into the doctor's office for any, any medical checkup, because you have to have many as you're pregnant. You have to do so many checks. Every time I'd go in there, I would be panting. I would be thinking, now what's the news today? What are they going to tell me? So I ended up developing gestation hypertension by the time I gave birth I'd also developed preeclampsia like my pregnancy just went from the excitement to deep down so 2020 I gave birth in December 2019 so 2020 I'm like okay I've had this baby now my life should go back to where it used to be if you've been ambitious mm. before you'll understand that if you face a hiccup you're like if I overcome this hiccup everything will be fine that's what I said and I have the baby in December. Oh, he's adorable. He's cute. I'm all like, oh yeah, I have a child of my own. It was, it was really a beautiful experience. I think having your first child really, it's amazing to watch. So I have the baby and I'm 
fat, extremely, I would, sorry, I'm using this, but I'm using it to my own, to my own thinking. I'm looking at myself. I'm like, this is not how I used to be. I used to be very fit. I'm not doing well. So I wanted to get back in shape, but of course it never happened. Not even first month, second, third, fourth, until like June of 2020. I look at myself in a picture that we are taking with all the Ugandans here in Queensland. And I'm like, you know what, Faith, something has to give, something has to change. So I went on this journey of reevaluating my life from the time I conceived to the time of this. And I'm like, what really changed? I can't say that my child who brought me so much joy is the one causing all these afflictions that I feel and this lack of self-love, lack of self-confidence, feeling like I'm a loser, feeling like I cannot achieve even the fitness that I'm longing for. So mm. that's the story is long. I don't know how long we can go. But at that instance, I decided to start doing a personal development on the sense, personal development in the sense that me as a person, I set myself goals and I'm like, I'm going to stick to these goals. I started by doing 30 day challenges for myself. I was like, 30 days are enough for me to track my progress. Let me create a system that is going to help me shed this weight. By the end of the year, I should be closer six months. That was June. So December, I would be closer to where I started from. Yeah. So I went on a journey. I started eating healthy, going to daily walks, creating like a routine and rituals that I had to do, whether it was shining, whether it was raining, whether we were in lockdown, nothing would stop me from doing that. And as a result, I lost up to 30 kilograms by end of December. So that was one of the things that led me to say, okay, if you make up your mind to do something, you can really achieve it. I started like from 220, over 100 kilograms to getting back to like 75 kilograms at the end of the six months and all that weight went when I did something with my mental health and my mindset. I didn't have to change a lot except increasing more movement and being mindful of what I'm eating. But that happened when I stopped feeling sorry for myself. Mm -hmm. So that led me to my fitness journey. The other facet is about my spirituality and I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how deep we can go, but uh, we can keep going. If you have any, you can ask me any question before we go to the next story, because the next one will also be long. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, oh, that's mm. that's so great. Wow. And thank you for sharing that. I know like it's uh, a bit personal and thank you for filtering it and managing to keep it concise yes. uh, because we don't want to get too lost in, in it. Uh, mm. And without getting the gist and i think you've really packaged it well so maybe just to play back for you um the bit that i got was uh, you know there was that moment you had that surgery like this this like the the it, in this story right like yeah, yeah it all starts mm. around the surgery right mm. the surgery happens like there's your life before the surgery and you have this perspective of what it should be like from what you've had before then the surgery happens and then mm. your life because like you know like once you have surgery there's there's the whole recovery period and there's there's a certain set of instructions you have to follow as you go through that recovery uh the doctors will make sure you you follow that otherwise the surgery made you like the recovery period is part of the surgery actually and yes. so yeah so that so sort of like by the time all that ended, you you had you hadn't you, kind of like your fitness routine went on hold, your eating changed, and all these had knock on effects. And then you find yourself um, like physically, your body sort of like completely changed uh, on you in that time. And but then you're also expecting, right? It's like <laughs> it's so many things happening at the same time, right? And then. Once that's done, you, you know, once you deliver the baby, you kind of like go like, okay, no, I, I need to get back what I think I lost. Right. And then you, I don't know what, how many things you tried, but you find, you get to a place where you, you, you realize that now I have to, I have to take this on. And then guess what you go back to, you go back to, you know, the, your scientific approach where you, you sort of experiment. It's like yeah. I'm going to run these these experiments and see if they are releasing results, and you know, you sort of like break it into smaller 
achievable goals and then you try and try again exactly. and build on those results and and then the results come and then you're like oh actually i, I can do this <laughs> right? exactly as you've said it yeah Mm-mm. yeah no that's great like uh and, and i think i think most of the time we undermine the the wisdom within us what we already know like we we don't reuse uh, the skills we have to solve uh you know, new problems. We mm-hmm. sort of like tend to think that if it's a new problem, then we're going to need new skills to solve the new problem. But actually, if you look back, uh, you may have solved something similar before, or there have made already be skills you have that mm. you can now re, uh, you know, re- reorganize and apply now in a different way. And I think that's that is where you know, like the applying our own wisdom, like sort of like. Uh, using our wiser selves to to help us through things that we haven't yet encountered and are encountering for the first time um but yes you you wanted to share about the 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 spiritual journey now like um, yes i just yeah i, I hope i hope so far we I'm, I'm getting it the way you're sharing it yes exactly as you've said it because I knew that 30 day challenges were more achievable than saying I'm going to work out or eat healthy for 90 days. 30 days is just enough time for you to see a change. The scale might not tip to the direction that you want it, but you'd have built the routine. You'd have built the confidence in what you're doing. And Mm -hmm. I have so many habit trackers. I have a habit tracker that I've designed. I'll, I'll share it with your audience. If anyone wants to use this, an Excel sheet that in that habit tracker, you write down six habits. It's limited. You can do up to eight, but I usually do six habits. And in those habits, you have a monthly spreadsheet. Every time that you complete a habit, it's your input that matters. You're going to tick off that habit. Let's say if you walked 10 case steps and that was that was your goal, you'll tick it off. If you said, I want to read 10 pages every day, you tick it off. In 30 days, however much you might not have seen a change in your weight, let's we're looking at it in weight loss and fat loss and fitness. But there will be a streak telling you that this is what you did in 30 days. Though the effect might not be seen physically, what I notice when it comes to especially fitness and establishing healthy rhythms, we always give up so fast because you're thinking, okay, I've worked out in a month, I should be able to lose five kilograms. Sometimes it doesn't work like that. And if you've not optimized your fitness journey and your wellness journey, you won't be able to see the results because you're looking at it just jumbled. But if you have a way to track your progress, even when you feel you don't have the consistency and the motivation, there will be a streak that you've created for yourself. And that streak mm-hmm. will help you in the sense that you will be able to see the effect. There will be your input because input, you can track it. You're like, okay, I walked, I ate healthy, I meditated, I read, probably I prayed or I drank my water, I ate my vegetables. There'll be a streak. You mm-hmm. cannot refute it. But again, that streak will de- the results you get from that streak will depend on the input that you put, you know. Mm. <laughs> so there was mm. a visual cue and a visual representation of my activities. Every 30 days I had things I was tracking. And when I started tracking them and also working on your mindset, because fitness has been there for many years, the fitness industry has the most money ever invested in it. People know what they need to do, but it's execution that really fails. We know we need to be eating healthy. We know we need to be drinking our water, avoiding stress, going for walk. But we don't do those things, and we think there is a shortcut to where we want to go. So Mm -hmm. by creating myself that cue, it allowed me to track my progress over time. And as I built this routine, on days that I would not do it, I would feel like, what's going on? I need to get up and move my body, you know? It became a habit and it's from those habits that I was able to transform my body and also noticing that my brain had to be on the right spot and on the right journey for me to get those results. Yeah, no, that's, oh my God. You know, you, you touched on that and uh, I was um, I, I was watching Alone. I don't know if you've seen that show. Um, there's, uh, there's this I'll show. I'll write it down. Mm. Yeah, so there's, uh, I'll tell you about it. So it's a it's a show called Alone. Mm. <laughs> mm. The concept is you're put in the wilderness alone with uh, you choose I think ten survival items, mm. 
Mm. And they give you like uh, a few things that you may need, like, mm. you know, a tap to make a shelter, some ropes, and then plus your 10 items, and they give you a spot in the wilderness, and it's like, there you go. Whoever, they put like about 10 people in the different parts of the wilderness, and whoever is like the last person standing or the last person to leave wins the, the competition. It's like, out out survive each other it's like if you take that show called survivor but then uh you take it to the next level right okay yeah <laughs> yeah mm-hmm. so they give them the phone uh to uh, like a satellite phone to call when if they get a medical emergency or if they just can't do this anymore they want to tap out um but watching that show is very very interesting uh to see the different survival skills that people have to apply just to survive and the different advantages of skill sets. Uh, it's like people from different backgrounds just trying to survive in the wilderness. From what you've shared, it's like you touched on building a routine and uh, you spoke also about rituals. And that was so alive for me because I, I noticed that with the people who survived longer, Hmm. they just got into a routine really fast. It's like they were very intentional about their food strategy, but they also had this this repetition. It's like, oh, no, 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 every day I wake up at this time and then uh, I'm going to uh, try and catch some fish uh, for this amount of time. Uh, If I'm successful, if I'm not, then I am going to go... uh, foraging in the forest to see if I can gather this, then I need to collect firewood, and then I need to work on my shelter. It's like I have five things which I have to keep doing every day if I am to survive. And those that fell into that routine sooner lasted longer in the competition Mm -hmm. than those that had only like, "Uh, today I'm just going to sleep all day. Uh, Maybe I'll look for food today or maybe tomorrow. (laughs) I don't know. Let's see what Let's yeah. see. Let's see what the day brings, right? Many of those who kind of like had no routine, they drop out. Like they wake up one day and it's like, no, I just can't do this. I'm sorry. I'm done, right? But those who had their routine, they just kept on the routine. They just kept doing, it's like, oh, no, no, I'm just catching some fish now. And then I'm going to do this other thing. Then then I'll do this thing. Then I'll, do this thing. Then I'll find myself at the point of catching fish again. And then they keep going around in this circle and... It takes them days and days and days because they are not trying to do the days. They're just trying to do their routine. <laughs> and their routine just keeps them going and going and going. And the other thing that you, you know, like like routine can be very associated with um, uh, with uh, rituals, right? Like, because each... Each aspect of the routine is a ritual, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, there, there was this person, and I, I, I don't know why I'm associating it this way, but for them, it was very important to speak to their loved one. So they got a rock. <laughs> they got a rock that they, they thought <laughs> looked like this person, oh. and and they just needed something to be a placeholder for that person <laughs> basically mm. and then they would have conversations with this rock they would talk to it and in the process as they're talking like their mind would unlock and go like oh actually yeah that's what that you know that person would say but if they're like really trying to take it seriously uh the the the, the sort of like the the wisdom of that person which they already have from from the many interactions they've had before, would get unlocked and would become available to them in the situation. And then they would get the advice. It's sort of like what we do when we're praying, right? It's it's like you, you're really just trying to, well, at least this hour, I think I was like, you're presencing uh, the wisdom that is from a place that you don't have physical access to yet. And so... It, for a long time, it puzzled me. Uh, like there's this, because uh, I'm not Catholic. I was raised uh, Anglican. I was, all, I was always fascinated by the emphasis on the saints. Right? It's like, why are you praying to the saints? Why are you praying to the saints? I don't get it. But then it made sense. Like, oh, this is why you pray to the saints, right? The saints lived a life that embodied a certain wisdom, and 
if you try to represent that spirit of that wisdom, you can partake of it and then it's going to inform your current life and then you're going to now have access to wisdom that you didn't have access before to mm. say, like, oh, this is, wow, prayer is so powerful. That's amazing. So you can pray to saints, you can pray to God, you can pray to the Holy Spirit, you can pray to faith. <laughs> you can, it's like, you, you can <laughs> <No>. pray. <laughs> yeah. No, but, but, but it is true because it's, mm-hmm. it's like, it, it's, it's a pocket of wisdom that is mm. there that you have to access. And the way you, like one way to access it is, you have to consume it, kind of like how they will give you here's a set of neurofin or whatever. You take one at a time, but this is like spiritual. <laughs> so now you have to find that spiritual capsule and you know consume it and then let it you know happen in your life, right? Mm-hmm. And but uh, that's a bit of a tangent. And uh, but but that that you you to do that, right? Like you need a specific way of doing it because you're not always in the mode where you can consume that. It's like with things like prayer, you have to put yourself in a certain state, you know, to be ready to receive and to be ready to have that openness and to be able to have that clarity. It's like you have to clear your mind, kind of like that character we're speaking about in the level. So Mm. you need to empty your mind out so that you are ready to receive uh, yeah. the vision that's the, the the wise vision that's going to come to you, right? But if you're not if you're not preparing space for it, mm-hmm. where will it go? Will you be able to see it? Will it fit your current? If you don't have space for it, will it go there? No, I don't know. But but anyway, mm-hmm. yeah, so I, I go on a tangent. But all these things that you've shared sort of like <laughs> open <laughs> this portals for me. It's a beautiful like, tangent. Wow, it's amazing. <laughs> It's a beautiful yeah. tangent. I love how you think about things in a unique way. I haven't met anyone who thinks the way you think, which is amazing. You have a philosophical approach to life. Yeah. So it's good to listen to your tangent. I also pick a point and I'm like, oh yeah, probably that's true. Some of them like, Mm-mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah but that's yes, okay. you should take it with a pinch of salt. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. No. So, so that's great. Like you, so you sparked all that. So now I'm curious about your, your, you know, like speaking about spirituality. Like, like you said, that's a whole other story. Yeah, that's I th- another I think story. We can jump into that. Yes. Yeah, so, so the second story, the second story also starts. I don't know. I think when I'm going to become a, they say every time you become a parent, a new self is born. Your new self is born. The first time I understood that because I'd never been a parent. I've had cousins. I love my cousins so much, my nieces. But I used to love those kids from afar. Not from afar. I know they're my cousins, they're my nephews, they're my nieces. But I love them in a far that I didn't really associate motherhood as something that I was going to partake then. I didn't envision myself to be a mother then. I was like, oh, those are my nieces, my nephews. Now I become a parent. When you become a parent your parenthood nature is born. Your motherhood nature is born. It shows even for animals. You see when a chick is laid, is it laying? Yeah, eggs are laid. Then the chick develops from the egg. You'll see that the mother will become like this mother figure who will be able to protect their chicks irrespective of anything. In any way, they will shield them. They will come. They will become very, very aggressive if you came close to the chicks. So that happened with me in motherhood. And I enjoyed Mm. being a mom to my son. In fact, motherhood is one of the things that if you ever wish to be a parent, parenthood changes you and motherhood changed me in a sense that I would see myself in my little one. So my son grows, he becomes one and a half and we are thinking of another baby. So I'm like, yeah, this is the right time for me to have another baby. I already experienced that one. Those tragic moments have really gone out of my head. Because motherhood in its sense, if you experience it the way I experience it, you know that sometimes it leaves some bit of trauma. Trauma in the sense that you're not the things you go through that you, your body forgets, your mind forgets. So you need time to forget all that trauma of childbirth, trauma of what I'd gone through, as I've explained. So I was ready to have another baby. So I conceived. And when I conceived, the pregnancy was good. My daughter's pregnancy was far 
was a hundred percent more than how it was for my son and i loved it so and so in australia also elsewhere they usually do the 20 week scan so the 20 week scan i get in and the doctor is like the sonographer looks at whatever they have to look at the baby's anatomy and all hmm. she finishes the first scan she tells me oh, we still have to scan more then she scans more and she's like oh yeah i noticed something hmm. on your child and i'm like on my child this pregnancy should be fine if it's something it should be on me not on my child because me i can find a way out but this kid is growing in my womb there's nothing that can be done so to get to that extent of course i leave that that medical examination feeling scared and worried about what's going on because the sonographer mm. has no right to tell you the diagnosis or what they've seen you have to go to your doctor so time goes and i have to go to my doctor go to my doctor the doctor tells me this medical emergency not an emergency medical interpretation of the sonographer's report so it's like mm. we need to do more scans this is what we are noticing on the child and i'm like oh god what's going on i'm back to square one where i started the previous time and this time it, there was nothing i could do because the baby is in me the baby has to grow until they are born then we can really navigate that issue so i recall when i got that i sat in my car and i just cried to god i'm like god i don't know what's happening every time i'm pregnant something comes up this is a baby i prayed for and i'm so happy that you've given me a daughter i always wanted to have a daughter i'm like god please take this be in charge of this situation of course i also called a friend of mine who usually pray with we pray together i told my mom about it and i leave it to god so i go for the next scan i think two weeks later just report tell me they're not seeing anything and i'm like okay what's going on but i take the report back to the doctor and the doctor tells me that's okay but the doctor is like since it was seen in the first time we have to keep doing these scans over and over time until you have the baby so I ended up going to even the biggest maternal fit, fit or maternal health hospital here in Queensland. I have more scans and scans and scans and scans. And also I went into labor earlier than normal. Usually people go in labor 40 weeks. I went into labor 37 and four days. I go into labor. I didn't know what to expect. I had give birth to my child. And my child was whole in the sense that I had to do a scan a week later. And that medical examination they had seen when she was in my womb was not there. So it took me back to the prayer I'd prayed. I told God that if you do this and I give back to a healthy baby, I'll do this conviction that you've always put on my heart to share more about your good news and your word. Hmm. And now the truth had come out, my child is healthy. So what ex- do I have to do? I have to fulfill what I say that I'm going to do for God. I call them vows. I like to use them because as I read the Bible, I noticed many yeah. of the prophets and the people he used would ask for a sign. When you look hmm. at, there's this guy called Gideon. Gideon looked for a sign. When you look at <laughs> Moses, Moses got signs. God had to coach him, coach him when it came to the wonders he was going to show the Egyptians. When you look at David, David had signs. So I'm like, God, if this sign that my child is going to be fine, comes true and I give birth to a child who has no medical complication. I did an echogram when she was one week later. It was something with her heart and her heart was perfect. There was no any issue. So I was like, you know what? I made a vow to someone greater than me. I can't be there and I'm like, okay, I made this vow now I've achieved what I want. Let me just sit by. Of course, it also took me time because I didn't really know how to communicate this. But it's through this self-exploration and also praying, reading the Bible, that I got the confidence to do what I'm doing right now because it was more of a fulfillment of something that I'd asked God and God had given me. So Mm. hence the birth of For His Glory podcast. And it's Mm. lovely to see that most times when I ask God for those small things, he comes through in the sense that he will give me what I want, but I still have to do the price that I put on it. If I say... I'll serve you or share more about you when you've given me this and he gives it to me. It's mm. an obligation to me to do what I said I would do. Otherwise, I'll be a person of no integrity. Yeah, so that's the summary of it all. <laughs> no, that's great. Uh, it's like you you make these vows mm. to God and then 
God comes through, and then now you have to do your part of <laughs> the bargain, right? Yes. And yeah. I, I, and like, I, I, I appreciate that because I think it's, um, in a way, it grounds you, right? It keeps you honest. It, it maintains your integrity. Like it's, uh, you, you stay, how do I call this? Like, many times we forget that, right? Like we forget to keep our promises and our vows. And in a way, by not doing that, you change yourself. You change the person you are. Yeah. So, um, and I think like, you know, it's a very important virtue. Like growing up, like, you know, where I grew up, it's like, that was always debatable, right? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it can be looked at as a weakness in a way mm. in that, you know, what is the word? You have to be, you know, what is it, the street smart, right? Like you have to be very flexible. You have to know how to get away with things or th things like that. But I mean, like you could do that in physical life, but not in spiritual life, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because, mm. yeah, yeah, God is always seeing and he's, he's everywhere. Um, but yeah, one interesting thing you've touched on there was... Uh, the birth of the mother, right? <laughs> it's like, it's like, it's, it's like that's, that's how I hide it, sort of. It's like, yes, you know, yeah. You, when you, you, you give birth, it's like, like this becoming a mother. So it's kind of like you were born into motherhood in a way. And it's like, now there was faith. Now there was faith, the mother, right? <laughs> if I may call exactly. it that Exactly, yeah. Mm. <laughs> and then it's like, Mother Faith was had to sort of like, I don't know, what, what was the contention between uh, Faith and Mother Faith, <laughs> right? If I make I characterize it that way. Yeah. So when <laughs> you think it about. It sounds like th those were two different characters, right? Yes, they are. When you think about motherhood, I didn't know this until I became a mom. Motherhood does not come with a manual. <laughs> There's not a, a standard operating procedure that you look at and like, oh, I'll operate like this with my mother. So there are all the things that you instinctively gain when you become a mother. Instinct in the sense that you have now someone who solely depends on you. And also having gone through the whole system of pregnancy to childbirth. Actually, childbirth is where by that change comes because... By the time you give birth, science has it. There are so many hormones raging in your body. Those hormones have to make sure you go through labor because labor is one of the most excruciating pain experience that you'll ever experience if you're a mom, if you're going to be a mother. And your body is made in a sense that instead of it just releasing pain signals, it releases the oxytocin, which is the, called the love hormone. And that love hormone actually helps you reduce the pain you feel out of labor. I had to explore this when I was pregnant on both times, when I had my son, as soon as I gave birth to him, my body was in shakes. Like, it's like nothing would warm me. And when I asked the midwife, she tells me, you know, oh, this has to happen because your body has gone through shock. Childbirth is more like a shock thing. And when it goes through shock, your body has to create a mechanism that can get it back to its starting position, like make the thing be in equilibrium. Mm -hmm. And when she told me that, I was like, oh, wait a minute. This is this is really amazing. When that happens, even after you've had the baby, you will still be in pain. You'll still be feeling all these fuzzy names. Of course, you've just had something happen to you. What happens is you won't notice the pain. As soon as the child is out of your womb, if you've given birth, the natural way, like vaginal birth, you notice that your body Will release that love hormone that you not even care about whether your placenta is out, whether you are bleeding, whatever it is. It's more graphic, guys, but that's childbirth. But you won't notice that you'll be is so in love with this creature that you've given birth, this child that you birthed. So that happened, and when that happens, it re it really leads to a cascade of things. I'm not a doctor per se, but this is how I understand it. It will lead to the hormones that are raging in your system to make sure you sustain this baby. And that love hormone comes in and that love hormones also brings the feeling of possessiveness. You have to guard this child. You have to make sure you are awake. That's why you see new, new moms can operate on two or three hours of sleep because your body has to catch up on the need that has arisen out of you giving birth. So 
that's how I understand motherhood at that instant when you've given birth. But after you've had the baby and you're out of hospital, you're back to your home, you have to really now be the mom. You have to be the food provider, the nurturer, the like the comfort to your child because the child is in a new environment. They've never been for you. have been experiencing this world. You understand it. But this child has come. They are so new into this world. It's not as warm as they were there. They were just floating in that, <laughs> that fluid. Now they have to be covered, they have to be warm. They haven't been able to eat with their mouths. Now they're learning how to suckle on your breast or take the bottle. So all that creates a change. You might not notice it on a surface level, but it happens even on a physiological level. So what motherhood taught me the first time was I'm capable of hard things, you know, like it's just an affirmance affirmation that really I can give birth if I can give birth to this child naturally without any epidural, without any pain assistance. There are so many things I can do, you know? So it gave me that confidence. And when it happened the second time, of course, that confidence went on a higher ground. So I was born as a mother because now I had two human beings that really depend on me for their survival. If I wake up today and I don't feed my child, my child might grow hungry. My child might have an issue if I don't take him to the doctor. So there's all those intricate things that happen when you become a parent. And the new identity of yourself, now you start seeing yourself in a different plight. You start seeing yourself in a different way. You're like, if I can have a baby and give birth to this baby, that means I can do hard things. Your mind is reprogrammed to think of yourself as a person who is capable of doing things that Initially, you might not have thought to be capable. That's how I can sum it up. But it's more of a big, big revelation, if I say so. Yeah, no, it sounds intense. And uh, speaking as a father, it's like, you know, you can witness this, but it's not an experience like Mm. you're going to get. And I think that speaks to the, you know, like the parenting challenge. Uh, I've heard a lot about this. It's like the way fathers approach it is going to be very different the the way mothers approach it and i guess it, that's why you find like there's a need for both uh you know it's like the, you need both perspectives and both approaches kind of like going back to that divergent convergent thing we we're speaking about earlier um i think if you get both approaches and then converge them on this child then there's uh probably more you know how can I say, more opportunity for them in many aspects, right? Um, and I think juxtaposing that with, with say, fatherhood, it's like, for, for it seems like, you know, for a mother, it's like there's a big moment, right? Like the a whole year where this whole mother is being born, right? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, but but for fathers, it just happens. <laughs> In that instance, like, oh, congratulations, your father now is like, ah, uh, okay, right? <laughs> yeah. What I would add on that, <laughs> what I would add on that is motherhood. It's like, it's like, let's. I'm thinking of it like building, building up a pyramid or as a cone. There will be all this best when you conceive you are the best so you keep on rising 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 by the time you get to the top if it's a volcano let me think about it as a volcano it has to explode that because there have been all these moments that have been leading you to become that mother from how your body changes mm-hmm. from how you feel from i was reading sometime and they were saying that the reason why mothers when they're pregnant they smell a lot is because their senses have to develop in a sense that they can change and notice something that is spoiled from afar so that they don't put it in their bodies. Mm. Because if you put it in your body and let's say you've eaten a spoiled sandwich or something that has gone off, it can cause an effect to your child. So your body has to develop in a sense that it can sense all those minute smells at the start of your pregnancy to make sure that it can conserve and preserve that baby that is growing in your womb. But I was like, hmm, this is really news. So there are all these steps that you go through when you're expecting from how your body changes, from the smells, from the morning sickness. Of course, the morning sickness is, comes in because of the hormones that are trying to balance. They need to be in high quantities, but not in so low quantities. So that need for equilibrium causes all the morning sickness. 
from how your bump is growing, from the body aches you feel, from how your bones start aching as you get closer to pregnancy. So all those things are happening in preparation of the big reveal, which would be having mm. your child at the end. So a mother is born from the time you conceive to the time you have a baby. By the time you've had a baby, you're just at the peak of that explosion. You're just a volcano that is exploding. And when it explodes, things have to taper down. And when they taper down, that's why you see the, this, all these morning blows after you've had a baby, postpartum blows whereby you feel some days you might have energy some days. Your body's trying to get back to what it used to know, but essentially it's not going to get back to what it used to know. So that is how I understand it in my simple wisdom. Yeah. yeah. No, it does sound like a, like a whole transformation. Like I, I say a whole meaning like, it's a wholesome, like it's not just physical. It's like physical, mental, chemical. It's like, it's like literally, it's like a, a new being is mm. born from, from that description. And I guess that is, you know, that is quite interesting. And like, you know, you going back to, to what, how we, we went into that, <laughs> that rabbit <laughs> hole, it, yeah. it sort of like all brings it back because you are it would make sense that that would then inspire you to go down th to this personal transformation journey because like you're not the same person no, it's like after that after that event it's like no the, the 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 faith that used to be there was gone and so now you had uh a new faith and this new faith had to reconstruct their life in a new way and and, you know, as part of that journey and as part of that process, uh, this is, you know, this has all led to this where we're at right now. And so it's kind of like you're still taking parts of your new, you know, this new version, right? Yeah. And taking skills from the old version and working together to build now an even newer version uh, to come. Yeah. And to add a little bit on that is with parenthood you notice that now you have to set an example you know if you used to do your things as hearsay there's this new identity you've achieved this new identity calls for a new way of operation in the sense that you now have people to look at you these little ones they say that babies and kids are like sponges they absorb what they see <laughs> like when my my daughter sees me doing her hair recently she brought a comb and she's trying to comb my hair because she's seen me trying to do that she might not know what the comb does but she's seeing it so you have to make sure now you're setting the example you want your kids to have if your kid wakes up today and you're not taking care of them they'll also sense that and they're like but what's happening to mom so you have to step up to the new role that you've achieved in the sense that now you have people these little ones who are looking at you who are observing everything that you do who are going to imitate and look up to you for all the things that they need to do in their life so that calls for a change you can't be doing your things the same way sleeping in until 10 a.m when a kid needs breakfast or leaving your child to cry when they need to be nursed and diaper changed so there's all this identity that happens when you come to being a parent and it's really for the good <laughs> i think we need to start including being a parent on your resume when you're applying for a job and a position because those are so many skills that you need to put to use when you become a parent yeah yeah no i i, I completely agree with that and you know for, from even that description it seems like as you're parenting these new little ones you also have to parent yourself at the same time uh because you know you you can't be how can i say it's like you have to aspire to be the best version of a parent that you can be right but you don't know what that is right so you have to <laughs> learn how to become that right yeah uh, and as you're doing that you're also you know parenting this one so you have to motivate and which also reminds me going back to uh that personhood we're talking about like you know you sort of have to be a jesus in a way to this child and course you're not probably going to be as successful uh but you know i don't know i speculate 
but you have to be. You're in a, you, it's, it's not negotiable. You're already in the situation. So like yes. now you have to work. You have to work through this situation, and like, um, like you've also touched on the parenting skills, man. It's like they are massive. It's like the the things you you can observe, the things you can tell, the things you can do. Uh, these are like they make you very. They put you in this place where I like to describe it as you know uh, the optimal spot. Like you 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 get to this optimal sport where you ha- you're in i think it's a very ma- martial art concept whereby you're trying to find the most efficient position to hold where you can do many things from right mm-hmm. um uh i think it's uh yeah in in, in something like tai chi the, the the person is trying to hold just a position and be able to fend off as many things that are coming at them right? From that one spot. But they have to practice their whole life to know what is that spot, what is that mm-hmm. stance they need to hold that allows them to do those many things. Uh, in boxing, it would be different. It's like they, they learn how to carry their weight mm. and put it at the point of, of the punch. It's like they have to <laughs> figure out how, which many ways do I ha- can I maneuver my body such that every time my punch hits the other person, it's like carrying my whole weight of my body. Right. And so that <laughs> if I throw, yeah, it's like they're becoming a projectile mm. uh, such that if they hit you properly, they can disintegrate you. That's why they have those weight classes. They would oh. not want to put someone heavier against someone lighter, because if that person successfully manages to throw themselves at this other person, that's, you know, a smaller weight. They're just going to crush them. Like mm. there won't be anything left. <laughs> uh, I, I, I over dramatize. But but it's the same essence. It's like the, the, there's uh, a combination, you know, that that of bringing that all that divergent thing into this one point, mm. and then making it as efficient as, as possible. And so, I feel like even with parenting, we're sort of doing that. It's sort of we're taking the whole world <laughs> and bringing it to this little child in the best way possible in this, in the way that we can. And so. Uh, and for them, they are like really open. They are like that <laughs> character from the Lego. They have a blank slate. Yeah. They want everything, and they are looking to you because I don't know. They've been. They have. They, you're the only person they know. Mm-hmm. So, I'm saying, great, give give me everything that you can. <laughs> right now, I, I want it. So, whatever you're doing and not doing, I want. Mm-hmm. Whatever you know, whatever you're excellent at or not excellent at, it's okay. Me, I'll take it all. And and that's why you go. When you yeah. see them taking your mistakes <laughs> or things, your, your uh, unfavorable habits, you're like, stop it, stop it. Yeah. Not that. You you know, like you can take all these other good things, but leave that. But do they know at that point? They don't know. Oh, it's just a thing. Hmm. Parent does, I, parent does, I do. <laughs> <laughs> and so, <laughs> yeah. It's tricky. It's tricky. Uh, but yeah, like I, I get that we have to also parent ourselves in the process of parenting because uh it's vital uh to to sort of uh be the best parent that we can be and i think yeah you that that was a very good one um yeah and i know like uh, so wait there was some more thing that i wanted to touch on but i think no i think i think we've covered (laughs) (laughs) so maybe maybe yeah yeah. Maybe one more thing, like uh, that, I would be curious. So, like af- after having gone through those things, mm-hmm. what are you? So, so you, you know, what are the practices now that you have? Because, like you mentioned a few times, that you have this newfound routine, right? That's yeah. like really helping you uh, mm-hmm. maneuver this and sort mm-hmm. of like. Uh, how do I describe it? Like live, uh, live your life to satisfaction yes. as you, you know, as, as, as you see fit. Right. So I'm, I'm curious, what are those practices that you have adopted, uh, you know, that you didn't have four years ago? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So one of the, pra- okay, there's, there are quite a number of practices, but what I've done, like I got this book, 
I don't really use it because it's, I, I don't mm. know if people can see it, but this is like, it's called a work-life balance. I get them from Kmart. When I go to Kmart nowadays, I don't shop the clothes section. I go to the book section. But one thing I've done is I have a habit tracker. Initially, I used to use it every day, but now my habits have become part and parcel of me. Sometimes I might not track them. One habit I do is I do a habit of jan- of gratitude. I have a gratitude journal. It's it's a simple one. It's a five-minute gratitude journal. This is a new one, mm. but the one I have is in my in another room. I mm. write five things. It, it, it talks about, let me read for you. It talks about list three things you're grateful for in a day. Of course, the things should not be, I'm grateful for my child. I'm grateful for my husband. I'm grateful for my kid. Like, it should be, because initial, because these things you're already grateful for them, you know, you have them. But choose three things that you're grateful for that day that are not the norm. You might say, I'm grateful for shelter, but you have shelter, you know. Of course, sometimes you might feel like, let's say, if you've not been able to pay your rent and now you're able to pay for it, you can be grateful for that because there's been that hindrance of you not being able to do your rent. But I usually choose three things from that day specifically, which are not going to recur. I'm not going to re-experience the next day for that day. Like, let's say when I go for a walk with my son, recently I was going for a walk with him. Initially, he has his bicycle, but it has the trainer wheels. So we are trying to raise the trainer wheels and so that he can be able to ride without them eventually. But now he was trying to ride as he stands, like he's not sitting on the seat of the bicycle. So I'm grateful for that because I'm seeing his legs are developing in a sense that he's able to ride his bicycle without needing to sit. So that's progress in the right direction. I can be grateful for that because it's something that I'm not experiencing on a day-to-day basis, yeah? So I write down those three things that I'm grateful for that day, specifically that day. Then I also write, what would, you, what would make today a great day? These are like my intentions for the day. The intentions could be right now, right now, to make sure I show up and record this episode with you. That's That can be an intention because it's not going to happen the next day. I might not have the time to sit with you or you might not have the time to sit with me to record the episode. So those intentions are just those things that I have to do that day and they can only be done and they can only be done that day. So there's also a daily affirmation. My affirmations are drawn from the experiences I've had or the word I'm feeling on my heart or something that I'm enjoying or a quote that I find that I can resonate with. That one I usually feel it as the day goes by because I can get something different for every day. One of my affirmation, I think this week was that small change is still change. Mm. Meaning that even if I've done the least bare mom, the least minimum for the day, it's still an input that I put in that thing. And another one can be like, oh, I can do a thing through Christ who strengthens me. So that is also an affirmation that I can decide to write, but it should be able to, really fit into that day. Then there's also three highlights of the day, what turned out to be the best thing of that day. Then also reflecting on the day, today's reflection. Those are like one, two, three, four, five. So what am I grateful for? What would make today a good day? A daily affirmation, three highlights from the day, and also the day's reflection. At the end of the day, I usually do it at the end of the day when I'm here on my computer. Every day after I put my kids to sleep, I create some time to just sit and wind up my day. That's like my routine for my journaling in terms of gratitude. I also have other journals where I write my ideas and my thoughts, but I make sure every day I journal. My goal is to walk 10K steps every day. Some days I do it, some days I don't, but I try to walk even on days that I'm not supposed to go to gym and work out. That's a ritual Mm -hmm. that I have to do to make sure I move my body. And now that my son can ride a bicycle, it makes it easier that I don't have to go to walk alone. I can include him in the walk as we ride the bicycle. I'm also getting in my steps. Then I also love to create content by writing down my ideas. Like I have notebooks where I write down what I'm going to talk about that week, what I feel I'm drawn to. Then I also read at least 10 pages of a nonfiction book every day. The Bible does not count as a nonfiction book because I still have to read my Bible at the end of the day. But I make sure I have books that I'm reading. Right now I'm reading a book by a lady it's called Shelly Shambi or something like that. She, her book is called Unapologetically Ambitious. It's more of an account of her story, but I'd listened to her book in 2020 and now I'm reading it in physical form. 
And it's great mm-hmm. to pick those points from people who have achieved the life that you want to achieve. So I read a non-fictional book every day. Then the other thing is also create content and be a present mom. The rest of the things, I've optimized them. Like my nutrition is optimized. My workouts are optimized. I know I have to work out. But these are things I usually track for a given period of time. So in that ritual, I know that for me to do all the things, sometimes I need to wake up earlier than everyone else. As I record this, my family members are sleeping. So I've gotten this time to work on this right now. Then if I want to go for a walk in the morning and I want it to be a longer walk or a run, I have to do it before my husband wakes up because he can be with the kids, you know. So it's these things that I'm doing on a day-to-day basis to make me the person that I envision myself to be at the end of the day. And it's lovely to see that it's the small habits, as James Clear puts it, you fall to the level of your systems, if I'm to paraphrase. Like if you don't have a system, you won't achieve the goal. Some people think you only have to do things when you're motivated, but motivation will come today and motivation will go. But if you've created that system, your body automatically knows that when you wake up, probably read your Bible, drink a glass of water, put on your clothes and go for a walk, if that's your system. You won't have to think twice about it. You won't have not to organize your clothes the day before. You'll wake up and know this is just the automatic thing I need to do. As you drive your car, sometimes I sit in the car and I drive to my destination, but when I don't even know how I got there, you know? So that's how I've automated my life, that with those rituals, I have a sense of belonging. There are things that I know I need to do every day, regardless of how life is turning out. And they're helping me just have some predictability in my life and not feel like my life is falling apart. Wow. That, that's so beautifully said, uh, Faith. I, I would not want to add anything to that. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for sharing that journey, that story. It's, it, it truly embodies the, you know, what I was aiming for, you know, but by sharing the quality that is lived, it's not something you can describe, right? It's not, mm. it's not one or two things. It's, and even when you describe it, you feel like it's, it's incomplete. So it, it's too much to just capture. Mm. And so by sharing some of these things, I feel like it does show, you know, it, it does inspire people that oh you you can live a quality life and you can work your way towards it and uh it's not easy work and there's a there's a whole lot of things a whole lot of skills you need to capture along the way and 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 filter through and combine in all these different ways and shapes uh but it's possible you can get to a place whereby uh you achieve stability and satiation of of the life that you're living and from from your description you sound like a person who is living a quality life that is satisfying for them and you know w- would you say you enjoy your life of course i should say that like uh, before before I, let me just say this initially i used to worry a lot about things but now since i've created this routine it gives me the quality i'm looking for right now it's not complacency that i don't want to get more things but i feel there is some i feel there's some quality in the sense that things are working in the way that i want them to work and i'm also creating something because if i'm to track my habits for 30 days i'll see that there's progress i'm making however might that progress might not be visible in a in mm. in the looks of it but if there are streaks that i can say okay i did this i did this i did this i'm going in the right direction and recently a friend of mine called me and she's like, hi, Faith, how are you? The question, the answer, the way I answered that question, I was like, I'm happy. And she's like, well, you have never had anyone say that I'm happy. And I'm like, yeah, I'm happy. In, meaning that initially I was never, I was not happy as the year went on last year, I lost my dad and I had to navigate that grief. But now I'm at a point whereby I feel I'm happy because I've created things that I feel I'm in control of and they've helped me navigate that bottom rock bottom that I'm on and now I'm at the level where I feel I have more clarity I know what I need to do I know what I need to focus on and I feel I'm creating that impact that I'm creating and you can only get this when you're intentional 
then the other thing I want to say is every time I talk to you, Clayton, like I live edified, I live motivated, I live happy, I live like even when I go back to listen to this podcast, sometimes I'm like, did I really say that? How did I think about saying that? You know? So it's great to have long conversations that they open an avenue for you to tap into your wisdom side. And I really love having these conversations with you. Well, thank you, Faith. It's always a pleasure to host you. And mm. uh, hopefully I look forward to the next one. Uh, yes. th- there are other things we need to touch on. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there are. <laughs> No, it's mm. it's always lovely to host you. I'm going to end the recording there. Yeah. Mm. Thank you so much. It's been lovely. I love it.